Good morning. Hi, Billy. How are Good you? Morning. How are you? We're doing great. We're doing wonderful. And where are you? Uh, we're in LA. Um, it's nice and early here. West West <laughs> Hollywood. You can just see the sun peeking through the window over there by your Christmas tree. Well, <laughs> if one thing, there are many things true about you guys, and one of them is you attract an international audience. I am, uh, we have people from all over the world with us today through the blessings of technology and also the fact that um, in dark times, flowers are, are a wonderful antidote and intervention, aren't they? I um, was thrilled. I think the three of us received our copies of the book yesterday. This is the- We uh, just got it yesterday, just saw it for the first time. This is, I am thrilled for you. Now, intentionally the book's uh, uh, you know, uh, the you know, judge a book by its cover. They look kind of the same, but they're very different. So the first question, I think, everyone who has certainly who has uh, has a copy of your first book or want to know is what's the difference? Big question. What's the difference between the two books? Yeah. So the first book, Flower Color Guide, which I also have, you know, I've got here handy, um, is kind of the groundwork. This is the first stepping stone. Um, in kind of what we do in like learning and teaching flowers. This is identifying the actual flowers. So just as an outsider, when Mikey first started doing flowers in 2013, 2012, it was like learning the flower names and the seasonality that was kind of the first step to tackle. So it just kind of made sense for us that when we were kind of doing these books, that that would be the first one that we would create. And the second book, it kind of well, you, you tell them, how does it kind of lead out of the first one? Yeah, so after we made the first book, we really wanted to have a follow-up that would utilize the first book as a tool for the second uh -huh. book. And we figured that it sort of just spiraled and rolled into talking about how to use color. So the first book is all about the essential, you know, what the flower is and what the color of that flower is and that's the organization of it. So the second book is really, now you take the first book and now how are we going to create these palettes? You know, how do we use the color from the first book um, in arrangements and design? Color is such, uh, it may sound, I was thinking this morning here in New York where I am, I was thinking, well, of course you think about color, people think about color. I thought about, I have these um, grocery store roses because I'm a little affected. So of course I had to bring a rose into my screen, but you know, they're, they're monochromatic. I, I was thinking about color sort of, I actually was thinking, you know, about the rose and how the, but color is essential and it is a distinguishing characteristic of your, your work. Can you talk about that and, and how, cause the book, it's fascinating. You know, the book is as much as about as much about flowers and flower arranging as it is about color. So, you know, and seeing color. How has color influenced your work over the years? Color is everything to us. We always, we always like to say that flowers are our medium, mm -hmm. but color is our everything color that we do. Is what? I is, didn't hear. Uh, flowers are our medium, uh -huh. but color is our great. And that's what we, that's what we like to say, because it's, it colors everything. Color is everything. Yeah. I think a lot of people actually, I don't know, it's, it's funny, a lot of people don't live their lives in like considering color too much. It's really funny here in Los Angeles, we just moved out over the summer. It's like, we're in traffic all the time now, you know, we're driving everywhere. And it's funny, most cars on the road are either white, black, or gray. Uh -huh. They're the chromatic colors. And a lot of people live their lives in these like safe zones, uh -huh. these gray zones, kind of monochrome. And we of course bought a cherry red sports car to stick out. But <laughs> I think since you started doing flowers, the thing that it, it was, yes, of course you were gifted in creating flower arrangements, but it was your attention to color and just like, I don't know how seriously you took it that just totally changed changed my world, you know? Yeah, well, I think that a lot of people also don't realize that it's not just red, orange, yellow, red, you know? It's not just the rainbow of colors. It's, there's so many colors underneath that. And I think like highlighting that is really important. It really shows that there is this transition of color in everything that you look at. You know, there are millions of colors. Well, why, don't, and, why don't we look at, a, at, you know, we have some pictures of uh, spreads in the book. And so why don't we start looking? Uh, Ooh, this is a favorite. I, yeah. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, okay. So what are we looking at now? My screen, just so uh, London knows, is obscured by messages from, um, from the, the program that we're using. So, uh, so will you guys um, 
move the move it for us? Thank you. Okay, what are we looking at now? Yeah, so this is one of the spreads from the new book. And uh, uh, for this one, I really wanted to highlight that not only is this a warm color palette, but you can really pump up a warm color palette with a touch of a cool mm -hmm. color. And I love using pale blue in a color like this. Um, and then as a design point, aside from just color, it's also about movement. So I have a sort of linear dab this cool color through this shape that is really organic and soft. It was so cool, Billy, when we were um, looking for inspiration for this book, because like it was pretty easy in the beginning to come up with a few different color palettes and colorways. But like once we were creating arrangement number 78 or like <laughs> number 120, we were just kind of like bashing our heads against the wall. So we would go to MoMA, yeah. Guggenheim, the Met, and look, I, I mean, I was really drawn to kind of abstract modernism and seeing how the greatest artists of our time were using, how they're using colors. And it's really, it was really cool. Like if you look at a painting and you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, you really see how the artist kind of color blocked or kind of blended colors. So paintings that really inspired us, we take photos of um, and kind of try and base a palette or the color of an arrangement. Maybe because I'm just sort of a provincial American, I just wanted you to talk today about the squint experience. I saw my list of questions. It is so, I feel like it's, it's for grown-ups, but it's also great for kids, taking the kids to the museum. So talk yeah. to me, tell me about the squint. You taught me how to squint in a museum. Of course, I haven't been to many museums lately, but so tell me about squint. Uh, yeah, so when I'm making an arrangement, one thing that I do towards the end of the process before I think the arrangement is done is I'll squint my eyes so that all the little details sort of disappear, and then I'm purely getting shape and color, and that's it. I'm not seeing everything else. I'm not seeing so much the background. I'm literally just seeing shape and color. And in my mind, to know that an arrangement is successful is if when I do that, and I imagine that being a modern painting, I'm like, would I put that on my wall? And then I know if I would, then I know that it's done and that the shape is good, the composition's good, and that the color is good. So this means if I went to the Metropolitan Museum and I looked at one of my favorite paintings, um, Goya's little boy with the red, the red suit on, and I squinted, yeah. I would get information on how to go do a flower arrangement if I wanted to, with reds and all sorts of other things. This is, to me, this is this is yeah. very. I would I would do this at the King Collin grocery store, but you know, so I might fall down. Um, it's, it's not just about flowers either. It's kind of just Mikey tells me all the time because I'm always focused on all the little details that are running around that I have to learn to cancel out the noise. So you're canceling out the noise. It's the same thing when you're getting dressed in the morning if you're trying to put together a fabulous outfit. I mean, this idea of like living through color applies to everything in your life, your interiors, how you dress, how you present yourself to the world. And it's really a reflection of how you're feeling on the inside, but it's like, seeing the, the the basic color and shape and kind of taking all the noise and like breaking down the principles to be very, very simple is the first, is kind of the first start. Yeah. One of the things you, you say in the book, you found this wonderful quote from Matisse, which says, there are always flowers for people who want to see them. And I thought that, you know, it always through when we were working on the book together, that you also could say that there's always color for people who want to see it. Yeah. That is, that is, but now tell us about, let's talk about, we can keep looking at different spreads, but tell us how the book is structured and what the information is you've got. Let me see. Monochromatic, transitional, rainbow, triadic, accent, complementary, and analogous flower, uh, color situations. You have color, you have a color bar and they're with detachable color. I love the color yes. bar tell so much. It, okay. Bar. Maybe I should. What? Do show and tell, maybe. You hold it up. Yeah, I know. We're all so excited. Right um, oh, yeah. This is, or what, what are we looking at? We're talking about these. Yeah. The swatches. <laughs> the swatch. Yeah. So, okay. One thing, one thing that I just want to note before we dive into the information in this mm -hmm. book is that even this book is sort of, it looks like it's made for floral designers. I think this book has such a wide reaching audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really just, yes, flowers are the medium, but it really is showing how to use yeah. color. And you can utilize this in so many different ways. It could be for cake makers. It could be for tattoo artists. It could be for anybody. So there are little nods to that in this book, like we just talked about, like the color bars. Not only are there color bars in the back, but 
on each page, you'll see that there is a color bar that highlights the colors on each spread. So it kind of breaks down what's in this in the form of this in the form of these bars. Um, yeah. The, but so the color bar that you see on the left hand side of the screen is obviously kind of pulling out the major key colors from the composition. What I love is like the back of the book. It's almost like those kind of paint chip things. You know, when you're trying to repaint your living room, right. and you have to go find the paint chips. But like these are literally 175 color palettes that we've kind of designed for the book. I mean, it could, it, it could, they could be swatches for, I think the inspiration from this actually came with some of the fashion designers that we've collaborated with. When we do their shows, we always ask to see the collection. And if the collection's not finished, to see the swatches mm -hmm. of the collection. They, they have the inspiration swatches. So it's like, it's a, the whole back book is filled with all the swatches, which I think is super cool. Yeah, but yeah, these are little perforated cutouts, right? And then the arrangements on the back side of each swatch. So it really is just like a paint yeah. chip, but with multiple colors on each one. So even an interior designer could be like, oh my God, I love this arrangement. Let me base a room on it, you know? And like, like pull that Absolutely. out and bring it to the pants. Or even for those of us at home who, who are interior decorators aren't returning our phone calls, we and we're doing it ourselves, we can come up with a, a new scheme by looking at yeah. Um, um, go ahead, go ahead. What? Oh no, I was just gonna keep rambling on. Yeah. I was just gonna say that what this book isn't, and what I want people to know right now so they don't get disappointed, this is not a step-by-step -step guide on how to arrange flowers. We promise that that is coming and we, we are just starting to shoot that book, but this is really an exploration of color. And how when you asked how to use this book from the the, the appendices in the beginning and at the end, it's really trying to get into our heads of how we use color in our arrangements and in all of our work and why that's so important. I, I just, I don't want to disagree with you, but I have to say that as a result of this book, my flower arranging, although not, not by today's example, I actually am better at using color. I almost never would use color in arranging flowers at home until I read this book and knew where to start, which was with the squint. And then I had it, and then the book taught me how to flow, it transition, even in the in the occasions when it is monochromatic, because not every flower, these flowers, you know, I have what, 12 flowers here in a bunch in a John Darian vase. They're not all the same Ooh. color. Yeah, oh, sorry, name dropped. Um, we try and do a lot of that. Um, you know, I don't know that everyone understands that you're the photographer of the book, Derek. Will you talk? I know. You're a oh, master you, photographer. I mean, and the book is a is a collaboration of a lot of great talent here. There's we have Joao Mota, who is the who has art directed the first book and the second book for Fiden, and you and you have come along with doing amazing flower photography. You want? Will you tell us a little bit about that process and how the two of you work together to photograph? I think it's how the business began, isn't it? In yeah, I know. It's funny. I, I, a lot of people think I'm a, also a florist, which I'm absolutely not. I actually don't arrange flowers at all. Um, no, I'm a photographer. That's what I studied in college. Um, I When we first moved to New York um, in 2010, you know, I was trying to break into the fashion industry. I worked in digital retouching. Um, that I actually worked at... Um, a retouching house, we retouched like all the great spreads of that time in 2010. So like the spreads for Vogue, for all the major magazines. And what was so cool about that is I got to get access to the photographer's files and see their raw, how they shot in the raw, and then like what kind of filtering and manipulating, manipulating was layered on for the final image. And that was kind of like, that I consider that sort of my grad school because I really kind of learned the nuance of like color, contrast, brightness and sharpness all that all that kind of stuff um but when mikey first started arranging flowers you know i would shoot it um with my camera we put, just put it on instagram or whatever but i think the evolution from our first book to this book of how i learned to shoot mikey's work light mikey's work has also really evolved so it's it was a, such a fun it was an amazing process for me but um we shot in a pretty basic studio setting in our warehouse we had a few studio lights. We shot out in front of the big uh, foam pours. Um, and we wanted to kind of keep that clean and sleek look. Because, yeah. Of course, the first book is individual flowers themselves. And this is this is arrangements just for anyone who's new to the new to these books. Um, when did you do all the photography? About how long ago now? A year ago? When we started, when did we start shooting the book? Last fall? No, 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 no. 
Like, no, no, no. It was the, a, a, a year and a half ago about. So we, we had this like really aggressive schedule of we were going to shoot like like five arrangements a day every day that we were going to be shooting. And then that very quickly fell apart. And then I think, Billy, it was about a year ago mm-hmm. that you were kind of like, okay, guys, <laughs> you have to finish the book in a few months. <laughs> And we we really didn't have that many arrangements done. I think we had like twenty. Oh, so and now it's all coming it was, back to me. Yes, it's, it's all and we're not going to relate to deadlines. Yeah. Well, um, I think that we were. I think we we're being incredibly picky, like way too picky in the beginning. Like just little details that only I would notice. So we were really taking our time trying to focus on those, and then we were like. You know what? We just have to get this done. Like we just yeah, have to yeah, because I bet you, um, uh, people in the early in the early days of learning how to of, of attempting to do flowers are per- too perfectionistic, and it blocks them from just living with the comfort of the and the joy of the flower. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I also think that from me as a designer's perspective on this, I think that. I do some of my best work under pressure and under strict yeah. timelines. Like I really do when I'm just not thinking of mm-hmm. all those not overthinking it. I just kind of just pump it out. I just make it. And it's, I think it's some of my best work. Well, also though, the first handful of arrangements, I would even say that the first like five or 10 spreads that we shot, we didn't end up using. It took, it takes a little while to like get your gears going a little bit. And you know, the format of how we shot, it's dead on at from the same angle. So it's like once, once I think it was like we shot a few spreads and there was one day that Mikey did a, like an arrangement and it was like, whoa. And it was kind of game changer. And then it was like, you look back at the ones you've done and you're like, oh shoot, those aren't very good anymore. <laughs> so it took a while to get into it. And there were a hundred, am I correct or did you sort of pull a fast one on me? There were 175 arrangements in the book. There's 135. We, there was supposed to be originally, I think, 200, but we had to scale down a little bit. I think all said and done, there was probably like... Well, we did a lot of... There was another component that was supposed to be in this book when we looked at the layout. As you remember, we decided to scratch those. Right. So we did make all those flat spreads, but those are not included. So now it's just composition. But those, like the things arrangement. that we have scrapped, we actually was in concept, conceptually have been repurposed for your children's book that you're doing for fighting. Isn't that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we are currently shooting our kids book, which is really, really exciting. And it's teaching children kind of the in-between colors of the color mm. spectrum. So those transitional colors. It, yeah. It's really, really fun. Yeah, we're still so working on the beautiful, but what I've yeah. seen is really cool. Really cool. Um, so the so you published your first book. You had a decent, a nice business in New York. You published your first book and it became very popular around the world and you started to travel and you've been doing workshops. Can you tell us a little bit about what the experience of of that has been and what people talk to you about? Because pretty soon we'll start taking questions here. And I just, you know, what is it the people, what have you learned for, about flowers and color and photography by um, by being, going around the world talking about your book and your work? I think, okay, I think the biggest, like why the first book was such a success, and it's so funny, I really, I remember Keith, the the CEO of Fighted, right before the book was about to publish, he was like, guys, I want you to know flower books, sometimes they can be a tough sell. And I remember in the back of my head, I was like, this book is gonna (laughs) sell. I know it's gonna sell because there's nothing like it. Like, and it's such an obvious concept. And I think that's really important is like sometimes, we get so caught up in finding or trying to be so obscure and so unique that sometimes just like the basic idea is yeah. can actually be quite revolutionary if you do do it in a chic and sophisticated yeah. way. So I, I I can't tell you how many people came up to us over doing this. It was like, oh my god, I can't believe you guys thought of this. Like I, I should have thought of this. And it's like it's we didn't reinvent the wheel here. It was just kind of like, but we. Filling a void. Well, we realized globally it was the same response. Well, Everywhere we got Well, Mikey, you you always said that you know you would meet with particularly brides or, or grooms and brides, people getting married. I want to be more gender fluid nowadays. Um, and they would come in and and they would be like, so not a clue, bless their hearts, as they say in Texas, about what was what was available in the in the flower world. Right? No idea. Yeah, and there was, and that also was affecting sustainability, and so that was 
partly what drove the first book. And it was a, you say, and well, sometimes the best ideas are the obvious ones in that they are what, what's wanted and needed. Um, yeah. Do we have any questions from our, our friends who are watching this, this celebration of flowers and color this, mor this morning, afternoon and evening? It's always the first questions that trickle in. I know, <laughs> I know. And then once you break this, in the admin box. Okay, new to all of this, but new to, here's one from Raul. New to all of this, but feeling a gravitational pull to floristry, family owns flower farms in India. How did you guys get into flowers and how do you feel you found your true success? Yeah, how do you feel you found your true success? Um, well, to start getting into this, it really was a hobby for me and I just wanted to use my hands. I was tired of sitting at a desk at my job, so I just sort of started picking up flowers and I also had a gravitational pull towards flowers. Like I grew up in my aunt's garden, like always around flowers. I traveled a lot when I was younger um, and, you know, flowers have always been like this thing in my mind, this thing in my life that were really important and yeah, it was just a hobby and I just went for it. I just took a chance and I just played around and then Derek would shoot my work. And then there was a moment when we got published in something in the very beginning, you know, I didn't even know that people were taking notice of what we were doing. And um, that's when I was like, wow, this is actually something. Like, let's go for this. Let's let's do it. Uh, I, go I ahead, Derek, it, sorry. No, 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 I think that like the best advice we can give is okay so obviously you want to be doing something that makes you happy right like for your livelihood but you also want to be doing something that you're really good at and sometimes though you don't those aren't that isn't as like transparent as you think it is when you start out when you're like i'm going to become this like when i wanted to like i always knew i wanted to be a photographer i never in a million years would have thought that photographing flowers would have played such a key role in my life or with you i think it's not just flowers. I think you'd be incredible at doing anything with your hands. I think you just have like this tactile sense and it's like kind of figuring out what makes you happy, but then kind of like playing with that and discovering that and figuring out like, oh, I'm actually really good at this aspect of it. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. It does. But Michael, Mikey, what was your job before you this started? I thought people might find that interesting, what your background was. Yeah, I was in interior design and I worked for a couple of years. And honestly, the rollover and what I was doing there is so similar to what I do now. Yeah. You know, I transform spaces, whether it's with fabrics and furniture or whether it's with flowers. Here's a, I bet you're going to get this question a lot when the book is published. Do you have a favorite color combination? One that you often return to? I, I love red. Red is my favorite color, like that sort of vermilion, bright orangey red. And my favorite color combination is probably that red as a base with a touch of pale blue or pale milky green. Like that's, I think hands down, that combination always just does something to me. Um, how is the color in light of LA influencing you? Things are brighter here. <laughs> they are so much brighter here. I know, I was just, I just like was walking the dog to the dog park the other day. And when I was walking back, it was like 1030 in the morning. And just the way the light was like dappling through the trees and it was like 70 degrees. And I was like, it's December. <laughs> it's it's really nice here. <laughs> but it's also, it's refreshing being in a place. I mean, I love New York, don't get me wrong. I love it. My apartment's there, like it's my favorite city in the world, but there's something really refreshing about people being excited about color here. Color just, everything's bright. Everything's bright and colorful. People are bright and colorful. Um, yeah. And the flower market's nice. It's like a big oh, warehouse. Right. You can just like wear it's out. Is it open? <laughs> yeah. It's still yeah, open. It's open. Good. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips or advice for decorating for this festive season? whether that Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or winter solstice, bringing the light indoors. <laughs> we talk about that. Yeah, I mean, for me, a celebration is whatever you want it mm -hmm. to be. Um, and you want to go classic, pull from classic, but I think, I think it's really what you want it to be. But I would say 
before you do anything, take a look at your house and see, like, think about the materials in your house and really play off of mm -hmm. that. You don't want to play with your space. And I would say this for anything. I would say this is for a bride if they're getting married in a specific venue, you know? So play off the colors in your house. Like, obviously, you wanted to do something in our place. It's a little more traditional Christmas, you know, with the dried fruit and um, the greens. But I actually brought the fruit into this because we are in California. And when I think of Christmas in California, I always think of citrus. You right. Know, it's citrusy now, and it's like, it's all it's all here. So, yeah. Um, how do your choice of vases influence your flower choices? Do they? They do. Yeah, they totally absolutely. Do. There is um, actually, and then in the, we break it down a little bit in the back of the book too, but might be super it, I can find it. Yeah. I mean, um, I it's, oh yeah, you might not be able to see it. Um, but yeah, I think that my go-to is to find a vessel that is footed and that's wide and a little more shallow. So obviously I have a structure in there that allows for me to build that easier. Um, like this, we have one here. Oh. <laughs> this this actually made up this quite a few guest appearances <laughs> in, in Flower Color Theory. <laughs> this is um, the, our favorite brand, Ostia de Villat, which um, they hosted our book party in France when it came out last time. But they do the most beautiful whitewashed ceramics. But this, I think this is the key to Mikey's success or to his arrangements is using these kind of like uh, footed vessels that you can really spill over and show much more shape and organic yeah. gesture. But you, you have to think about the, the shape of your vessel, the height of your vessel, the width of your vessel when you're shopping. If it's a more narrow, taller base, you're gonna want something that is taller and maybe has more gesture on one mm. end um, of whatever material it is that you're choosing. So really, and we do describe that in this book. So even though it's not a how-to, there are a lot of tips on yeah. how um, to successfully create. Yeah, I think, you, I think you underestimate how much helpful in, arranging information there is in the book. In fact, Lawrence from Vancouver asks, uh, how do you weave monochromatic neutral non-colors like black gray with your color palettes? Yeah, so we actually talked about it also in the book that neutrals are sort of uh, like the connective tissue of color, right? right. So if, I, if I'm transitioning from one color to another, neutrals are a great way to pull those colors together or to just have sort of filler, like a back layer to your florals. So I would try to choose a neutral that really plays off the color palette. So if it's warm colors, I'd probably choose like something that is a warm, like a brown or a warm, like mauve or warm, some, something that's a warm or neutral to connect those together. And I would do the same for blue colors as well. I don't know if we could bring back up the, the photo of the black arrangement mm -hmm. that was just up here. I think it was like the last photo. Uh -huh. um, yeah, let's go back a little bit. Okay, so this is our black, this is like a version of one of our black arrangements. And you can see on the left-hand side that it's actually still quite a gradation of colors that are just in in a similar kind of family, or it's like black, black, black in the world of flowers is actually means yeah. like dark, dark purple. Yeah, but you can also see that there are a lot of neutrals in here. There's gray, there's this dusty mob, and that is is connecting all these sort of forms of, or these variations of blacks, purples, plums, um, all together into this arrangement. So I think that these neutrals are really, really important in an arrangement. Also adding depth, especially if you're working with a monochromatic palette in the sense of flowers, uh, neutrals really pull it together. We just got a question that asked, what was that page that we just saw with the color wheel? Would you talk about that? Page. We're, we're getting really nerdy in this book. We're kind of yeah. we're like, we're teaching color theory through flowers. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this just kind of breaks down sort of different color schemes or how we use them. Um, basically just terminology and a visual attached to it on different ways of using color. So whether it's analogous, whether it's complementary, um, there's rainbow, there's triadic, there's monochromatic in here. It, it kind of just breaks that down and talks about mm -hmm. it. Um, in this area. We were kind of joking right before we did this. There's like a gloss, the glossary of terms in the back and it's all of Mikey's terminology that he's basically coined, not like coined, but that he's used himself. But it's like all the things that he says, it's like Mikey's little pocket dictionary in the back of all, <laughs> all the different terms that he there has. There is a lot of great information in the back. And I remember when, the, when we, when Mikey did the glossary, after all, 
he, I mean, he at one point he said, is it okay for me to use my words? And we're like, uh, it is your book. So absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there is amazing good. stuff in the back. You know, you also, wait, what should brides be thinking now in the world today is a question here. Oh, gosh. What should brides be thinking now in the world today? Well, I, no, listen, there's a vaccine on the way. Don't, don't oh, stop planning your weddings. <laughs> no, it's our whole world. I mean, listen, the events world, the past year, it has been completely thrown off. I mean, like, talk about, like, pretty much every major event we've had has either been canceled or postponed in 2020. And I think just now, really, clients are starting to feel comfortable-ish to plan for this mm -hmm. summer. So I think next summer is probably the first time that you can really, you know, feel pretty comfortable planning an event of some size. Yeah. But if you, if, a, if you're a bride that really wants a big blockbuster wedding, um, you know, you're probably going to have to wait until the end of 2021 or even we're, we're booking 2022 now because people are starting to book further out. So they know that there's like more time so they don't have to worry. Yeah. I just got into business real fast. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but in terms of design, I mean, I don't know if this question is about, even about design, but I always tell people, screw what you think and just do what you want. So like wh whatever colors you want to use, just go for it. It's your mm -hmm. wedding. So yeah, no, actually you, there's a section of the book where we really talk, where we talk about color association and like, how there is so much association with like red or black or um, colors that are associated with holidays or supposedly feelings. And we like our advice in the book is to drop all those associations and think about what the flowers are for, whether they're for yourself, whether they're for like, for example, for a baby shower, yeah. like enough of this pink and blue stuff. Yeah. Like, why don't you think about the mother? What is the mother right. like? What is her thing? What are her favorite colors? What are her favorite flowers? So the same thing with your wedding. Like we're dying. I think we say in the book, like we're dying to do a chic, sophisticated, like all black color palette for a wedding with black flowers and just do it in a really chic way. Yeah. Um, one of the, we have a question that someone says, um, color scares me. What should I do? Color Get out of here. <laughs> no, no. Just kidding. No, cut. Color can be very intimidating, very intimidating, but I think you just have to take a chance and kind of jump in and try it. And then you'll realize what colors you can with and what colors you don't, or what colors sort of pull certain emotions out of you. I have like follow-up questions. I'm like, why are you afraid of color? <laughs> Was there a traumatic experience in your childhood? Well, also that, that, that's another thing, you know, like color plays such a deep part into our psyche. Like some people, maybe you don't like, purple or in the purple family and a lot of times I don't know like did you grow up with a purple room and you had a weird experience as a kid like I don't know you know like color play like color really holds a, a, an intense spot in our memory my well, well I got the last thing I'll say about it is yes you might not like the color purple but I guarantee you there are shades of purple that you would feel fabulous in either wearing a coat or some there yeah. there's always a variation of the thing that you think you don't like that would work very well. Dusty mauve. Uh, Richard said, tells us that Dusty mauve, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but would be a great stage name. Well, you know, but there's also, there's also social prejudice against, or, you know, fashion world prejudice against color. I mean, that's changed a lot. Thanks a lot to the Gucci people. But, um, you know, I mean, in the nineties during minimalism, you only wore black or monochromatic stuff. And so maybe people are just, just kind of afraid. We grew morning glories out in the country this, this summer. And one of my friends was appalled at the color that we had growing all over the house. You know, people are strange. She was. What color was it? The was it the purple or the, the blue ones? The blue ones. The blue I ones. Love, like, she thought we were sort of mm, not. I wasn't, Everyone I wasn't bringing up to my to fashion world background. Oh, well, let me, you should see what I'm wearing under, from the waist down. Um, <laughs> what are your hopes for the book? What are your goals for the book? I hope that people use this book and fall in love with it. And I hope that it becomes an essential tool in their toolkit of mm -hmm. comment. I hope that it really just becomes this useful thing that people around the world want to use and I 
I agree with everything that you just said. I also think that I think that to achieve creating this number of 175 centerpieces, we're talking centerpieces. There, we're not talking like large scale installations or any of that stuff. I think that you really had to reach outside of the, your own box to get creative with composition and design and lines. And I think that there's such a variety of styles of arranging in this book, and it really kind of. Um, you know, shows, it just kind of opens up a whole different world of yeah. inspiring people to, to shake things up for what they're doing now. With yeah, powers. that's true. Derek touched on that, but I didn't want to create one style of arrangement for all compositions in this book. Like we really wanted to break it up. We wanted to have some minimal Ikebana inspired arrangements. We wanted to have more lush garden style. We wanted to have stuff that's a little more modern and structured and sculptural. Um, and I think that in that, I think that's gonna create a book that hopefully is timeless because it'll sort of play into how flowers are always changing. There's one arrangement in here that I'm trying to find it. Of course, now that I'm looking for it, I won't find it, but um, it's literally a, a mound of carnations. Mm -hmm. And it was the last arrangement that we shot. And I, cause Mikey bought these like Marie Antoinette carnations, like they, they were dyed. It was like this dusty pale blue and this like kind of like brownish color. And he was like, it was like, okay, we gotta make the last arrangement. I was like, you should make a carnation mound. And so it's like, you know, we talk about sometimes the ball that we don't arrange in like the, the spherical style. And this was kind of our version of creating a carnation yeah. mound. Um, I don't know, it, I, I think you played around in a lot of different styles and I think it, it really well, is. I think the book is wonderful. Fine and, and I, we think you guys are wonderful, whether it's, your latest fingernails, your dog. You're basic. You're a little basic right now. <laughs> you, you keep us. You keep us happy and young and um, full of hope. And particularly through these dark months, working on this book for all of us has been a good deed in a dirty world. 